Good morning and welcome back to my garden. Since last month was wildlife garden month, I thought I would do a little tour to complement the vegetable garden tour I did last week, which if you haven't seen it, I will link it up above so that you can check that out. It was our spring garden tour. I thought I would take you all around to our some of our landscaped gardens and <clears throat> discuss the wildlife benefits of a lot of the flowers and shrubs and everything that we've planted to, you know, kind of a belated celebration of Wildlife Garden Month. And I know that a lot of people are interested in pollinator gardens. I thought it would be helpful for me to share my thought process when it comes to selecting different plants for our landscape gardens. Before we take a little tour through the gardens, I will say that there are some criteria and goals I have, you know, that align with supporting wildlife in our landscape gardens and just also being sustainable in general. The first thing I would say is that I want to have a variety of flower shapes for plants um, to attract a broad range of pollinators. So it would include, you know, plants that hummingbirds like, moths like, butterflies like, bees like, and different bees um, as well, depending on their pollen collection habits. So that's probably the first thing I think of when I'm thinking about bringing a new plant into the landscape is do I already have this flower shape? And by flower shape, I mean like the umbral sh shape um, that you see in dill flowers, yarrow, uh, things like that and then you have like a main center with uh, petals around it that you'll see in like echinacea and um, you have tubular flowers that you'll see in maybe like snapdragons or delphiniums um, that attract different pollinators so just making sure that we cover our bases with that. The second thing I like to think about is flower color. So related to flower shape, different flower colors attract different pollinators as well. And some flowers have like patterns that we can't see on them that attract pollinators. So I wanna make sure that I have as many different colors of flowers as possible. Um, to attract different pollinators as well. The third thing that I consider is just the overall wildlife benefit. So it goes beyond like pollen and nectar production for pollinators, you know, in the summer, but it goes into like providing habitat for pollinators to overwinter and then extending that season so making sure that we have early flowering plants and late flowering plants and a lot of that is done by observation like I'll just walk around the neighborhood and see what other people are growing in early spring and late fall and that the pollinators seem to love and start there and then once I have like that foundation I can build up and experiment with different options as well. So uh, a couple of examples would be viburnums. They flower in really early spring or late winter, so are an early um, source for pollinators. And then also, like I mentioned, uh, providing plants that provide nesting um, for pollinators. This means grasses where bees will nest and use like the grass in their um, nests or um, shrubs so that birds can nest under there. And just, we also have our meadow square. That's the entire purpose of the meadow square is to support pollinators. And I will show you that in a second. And the way that we cut that is we'll cut it actually in late summer where we know that all of the overwintered insects have moved out and we can cut back the um, flowers and grasses, but then give them time to grow to provide winter cover. We also put grasses into our landscape so that, and then leave that, you know, any, any flowers that get tall and then die 
if they don't flop over like crazy then we just leave them and cut them back in the spring once we start seeing that new growth because it provides more cover for different insects <clears throat> also when it gets closer to winter I just stop kind of being so fastidious about pruning and things like that um, just because it comes up on like the rest time for everything plants as well and it helps save some labor or uh, even out the workload in, between the fall and spring seasons. So just a little bit of an overview about why I choose what I choose and I'll go into some more detail when we go look at some plants. Um, one more thing I did want to say is that in addition to just making sure that we're covering as many options as possible um, for biodiversity, I also try and make sure to plant plants that I'm aware of at least that support specialist bees. So for bees that have only evolved to work with one plan, I really try and um, find that plan and grow it. Um, that I'm still working on because that's a whole like rabbit hole to go down. So that's kind of the more advanced stages and it's not a bee, but one good example of that is the milkweed and monarch butterflies. So those monarch butterflies only use milkweed and so that's why it's really important to grow that. Um, but there's so many specialist bees. You can look up online, you know, what specialist bees are in your area and what plants they work with and so that you can also use that as a starting point to develop um, a more biodiverse garden as well. So. Anyways, that's enough talking, um, and let's get to the landscape, and I will start showing you some examples of what we have worked on. Okay, first up we have this part shade garden, and we have some penstemon in here. And you can see these flowers, some of these flowers are dried up, and this is a good example of an early flower source for pollinators. And making use of all different spaces. You don't need to have full on sun. We have some hydrangeas, some azaleas, and then we also have this grass up here. So, and then you'll see that I've used the leaves as mulch, which is good over the winter. And then it can also be used as some cover for insects as needed. And here is our meadow square right here. Our meadow square is about 20 feet by 20 feet. So it's a good size, but it's pretty small. You know, it fits in an urban lot like we have. And what we did actually was plant it out with a bunch of like native um, mix, seed mix and just saw what grew. And then while that stuff was growing, we actually had seeded some crimson clover in it and a lot of bees loved the crimson clover that honeybees like descended right on it which was awesome and now we get all kinds of pollinators there's crickets in there spiders there's everything in that meadow square all year and you can see we have some echinacea that has grown back we have rudbeckia that's growing back we have coreopsis and then we have lots of rushes which we didn't plant um but they do really well and provide cover for um the insects over winter and so you'll see this is really overgrown i'll move this so you can really see it's really overgrown which is not in a bad way i'm not saying that in a bad way but it is time for us to chop that probably late july early august so that we can actually rake it out similar to to the way you would with a lawn um rake out the thatch so that it doesn't get matted because you don't want to like suffocate the insects there and because we don't burn our property um that's which is really the healthiest way to um, provide a meadow ecosystem. We have to kind of do the best we can just by cutting it back really hard and raking out all the dead um, grass and clippings and things like that so that there's space for seeds to germinate with light and places for insects to nest for the next year. So this is like a huge part of what we do for our pollinators um, is just 
provide a relatively small square of space that we just seed with wildflowers, let it get crazy for a year, cut it back and then let it go. Um, and we will actually <clears throat> do some more management in terms of, I collect seed heads from some of these plants. And then when we rake out all of the thatch and everything, we will reseed so that we're kind of helping those plants grow um, and spread in the meadow square. And then this is what I call our front garden. You can see we have a common elderberry right here, which is great for birds and pollinators. We have some viburnums. This is a lot of shrubs that are growing to support overwintering pollinators and wildlife. We have a um, black lace, I think it's called, elderberry right here. That's a fancy one from Proven Winners, but another elderberry. We have a pokeweed that's gotten really big that um, I may leave because birds love those berries. I'll leave one. They reseed everywhere here. And then we have fruit trees, which are interplanted. So just an example of using your space for multiple purposes is, you know, we can grow fruit for us. This is a plum while we are also growing plants to support wildlife, like these viburnums on the right here. And then we have a nine bark here, which provides early season flowers as well. So that's really nice. And then let me take you around the front of this garden. In the sunnier spot, you can see we have bee balm, which there is a bumblebee working on right now. And then we have some Coreopsis that's already gone over. So I'll just cut it back and we'll get another flush. And then here is our front path garden which is really designed to mostly be things that support wildlife and insects and are durable. You know, this is low maintenance. So we have native plants here. You see more bee balm flowers. Um, this bee balm has been flowering for a month or so. So really having that long season of flowering. And then you can see we have some beauty berry shrubs in the back that's gonna provide fall and winter food for birds. And we have a small dogwood tree, if I back up here, right there, which is a native dogwood. So when that flowers, that will also support wildlife. And then we have a service berry right there in the middle. Again, a native tree that will provide berries for birds and a place for shelter. We have this growing, which um, grows, it reseeds really prolifically. This is a uh, false aster. So in the fall, this will get tiny white flowers all over it and the bees descend on it. So this is a really great late flowering plant. And we've literally just dug this up from places it's seeded itself and we do manage it because we don't let all of the plants that have seeded grow but um we transplant it with no problem you can see it gets really big and is a nice um, deciduous shrub you can see our little lawn area if you want to call it that in the front has tons of clover in it and it's just regular clover um it has other native what are considered weeds, but plants that pollinators actually really like. And so we leave our grass, quote unquote grass, it's not really grass, um, pretty long before we cut it. Um, just kind of as long as we can without it going too crazy, just to make sure we get these clover flowers so that the bees can also, uh, use those because the bees love the clover as well. And then over here we have our meadow, which I have planted um, to underplant our little tiny fruit orchard. And that's kind of an exaggeration because it's three fruit trees. So again, a good way for us to use the space in multiple ways is I have underplanted it with native grasses and plants that really like uh, full sun. This gets full sun all day in the summer. I mean, throughout the whole year, mostly. So we have things 
um, like Cherokee sedge in here. You can see we have milkweed growing. I have planted penstemons in here, which will do okay. Um, just a nice mix. And the theme is pink flowers. Um, so when you have a space that you're designing for wildlife, you know, I just want to share that it doesn't have to mean that you don't get anything out of it. It's not a place that you just give over to wildlife. You can still have a design element and it could be multi-purpose. We have some dahlias in here, you know, that do just fine and they're so pretty and it doesn't stop any of the other plants from growing or anything like that. But it's really just considering um, other things besides yourself. So I'm still able to have this, you know, it's all pink and I wanted it to be pink so that when it grows and matures, it's like a sea of pink. We have big blue stem in here so that it'll like turn pink colored. Um, and that's just my aesthetic preference. I organize my gardens by color. And so just sh sharing that you can have the fruit trees growing, that'll help you, you know, get what you want out of it. And then you can also plant plants that support wildlife as well. And then we have our moon garden over here. You can see we have a native jasmine in the top right corner. And then we have some bone set beside it. And then we have some uh, white swan echinacea that's going crazy right now. Oh, there's a bunny. Oh my God, bunny in there. Let's see if we can get this bunny. Do you see the bunny back there? This bunny has scared me <laughs> most days this week. I'm just walking through the garden and this big old bunny ends up being like one foot for me. So anyways, sorry about that bunny. We'll just keep rolling. Um, and you can see we have a uh, native hydrangea here and the bees love this as well. You know, just making that option for an indigenous variety when it is possible in the garden. And this whole garden is designed, it's a moon garden. So in the sunset, the sun actually sets in this direction. So the sunset makes this garden glow. And so the white flowers glow. And then of course the jasmine and we have a gardenia, which is <clears throat> not native, but you know, again, making the garden work for you, making the garden work for the wildlife, you know, uh, as the bunny has exhibited this morning, there's shelter for a bunny to hide from predators, <laughs> um, which I don't usually consider, but is nice. And just having that variety of purposes and multi-purpose in your garden um, is just really the most stimulating part of gardening, in my opinion. And then one last example for today is our herb garden. So this is like an herb garden that is very primarily designed to supply us with kitchen herbs throughout the year. So we have some whorehound, which is a mint relative on the right. And then going down, we have chamomile, good for teas. Love a chamomile tea. We have mountain mint, sage, chives. Uh, it looks like we have Thai basil there. We have hyssop, thyme, chicory, dill, shiso, oregano. I still have these few herbs to plant out. Um, well, got to upgrade the containers, mint and lemon balm. And then we have fennel over here. Um, but the fennel and dill are really good for the swallowtail caterpillars. So I make sure to plant quite a bit of that. So this year I've planted more fennel. These are, these two big plants are from last year, but there are a bunch of baby plants in there to just expand that. Again, the bees love the oregano. The bees love the thyme over here. They love cilantro flowers as well. So I really do need to seed some of those. And you may think, oh, well, cilantro just goes to seed so quickly in the summer. Okay. And then the bees love those umbral shaped flowers. So it's really good to have. And then we just use it as fresh coriander. So it's a kind of a win-win situation over here for our herb garden. We're able to have lots of yummy flavors and a lot of the pollinators love these flowers as well. 
Well, that's it for today. Just taking you through a pretty quick tour of some highlights from our garden and how we use our plants to support wildlife, primarily pollinators, but we love the birds, the bunnies, snakes, everything like that. So I definitely didn't do an exhaustive video. And one thing that I did want to share too is um, <clears throat> I didn't want to emphasize native plants too much um, or indigenous plants as some people call them. Um, especially in the case of specialist bees and specialist pollinators, it is important to be specific about the varieties you select if you want to go down that route. But there is definitely a benefit to planting, you know, annual flowers that you love, you know, and a lot of this is done by observation. So, and experimentation. So last year I planted out a lot of zinnias and sunflowers and tithonia and the bees love those. So this year, I made sure like that's where I'm going to focus. You know, I had planted out some other flowers that the bees didn't like so much and you know, you only have so much time in the day. So I figured, okay, well, I love zinnias and sunflowers and tithonia too. So it's not even a sacrifice. Not that that would be a bad thing, but there's still plenty of space for growing beautiful flowers for a cut garden or something like that and supporting pollinators as well. So it's not just about making sure you have milkweed or things like that. <clears throat> Those all have a place, but even if you just have a few containers and you're like, well, I just want it to be pretty, you know, if you plant a variety of things and you see the bees attracted to, you know, one more than the other, then maybe, you know, kind of go in that direction and letting, letting other, letting the pollinators kind of guide you in the direction you go. You know, like I said, for example, with the dill and cilantro and fennel, you know, uh, last year our, the swallowtail caterpillars ate down all of the fennel and dill like really quickly. And I was really worried that they didn't have enough food. So I don't want that to happen. So um, I made sure that I started a lot more and I'm probably gonna you know, keep building that because it's really important. And you can't go wrong with having fennel and dill in your herb garden. So I really hope this video was helpful to you. Um, if you are trying to support pollinators in your garden and don't know where to start, there are also a lot of vegetables that attract pollinators. When brassicas bolt, for example, um, and go to flower, the bees seem to love that. Bees seem to love cucumber flowers, um, bumblebees at least, and things like that. Just being um, observant as your gardening really goes a long way to understanding how you can help um, the pollinators in your area. I hope that was helpful and interesting. And if you want to know even more about my wildlife gardening, like I said, I just really scratched the surface. Um, if you have questions about, you know, part shade or shade or dry shade or, you know, different plants for different, um, sun requirements and things like that. I have all different types of gardens here and manage to find plants that support wildlife in all of them. So um, please drop a comment below, you know, if you want any more information about what I share today. And I hope you are able to have an amazing pollinator garden and support all the bees, moths, little wasps, um, everything so because it's all important so thanks so much guys and i will see you back here next week bye